Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, if you have a Bible, go ahead and open up to Psalm 51. This will be uh, during the sermon tonight. If you're new or you're visiting, my name's Tyler. I'm the downtown pastor, one of our elders here at the Stone. And I know there's not many of you in here, but I want to wish you happy Father's Day. Um, I know there's like three of us in here with kids, but I, I want to say for, for a lot of us, um, if you haven't called your dad yet, good opportunity to do that after the service. He's probably asleep already watching the golf, but um, I want you to, t- Father's Day is a good opportunity if you have an earthly father who has been good to you and loved you to rejoice in that. It's a gift. And if Father's Day is a sorrowful one because of hurt and pain it brings up, I want you to know you have a heavenly father um, who's everything your earthly father wasn't. He never leaves. He's always there. And so Father's Day is an opportunity for us to celebrate that we have a heavenly father who gives us good gifts and comforts us when things are difficult and trying. So we're going to be in Psalm 51. Psalm 51. So we're, we're in the second week of a three-week series. The title of the series is A Spiritual Life in a Secular Age. And the reason we're doing this series is because we live in a, we talked about this last week, a uniquely secular time. Not a uniquely sinful time, but a uniquely secular time. Because right now in our culture, our society, our common ground that all of us would agree to, that every person agrees to, the only thing we can be sure of is the material world around us as understood through science and technology. That's the one thing we agree on. And even those of us who believe in God, we find that more sure than even our faith. Like what happens in in a secular age is while we may not be completely opposed to spiritual realities being true and existing, we find them more and more improbable. Even those of us who believe in God find ourselves thinking that our beliefs feel more like a fairy tale and a myth in comparison to the secular age belief and worldview. And what happens in an age like this, you and I go through common human experiences like doubt and guilt and suffering, and in a secular age, those three things are evidence that God doesn't exist and he's not good and he's not trustworthy. Because human beings have always gone through these experiences, but in a secular age, they become reason why God can't be true. But God has not been silent about these things. Now, through the poetry and the prayers of the Psalms, God teaches us how do we seek him in the midst of these experiences. And so last week we saw how do we seek God in the midst of doubt, and this week we're going to see how do we seek God in the midst of our own guilt. And guilt in a secular age is a really important and complicated thing to talk about because one of the hallmarks of a secular age is the attempt to rid ourselves of any personal guilt by ridding ourselves of any objective morality. That's the hallmark of a secular age. Because guilt comes into your life and into mine when there's some standard we fail to live up to. Whether the standard's been given to you by your parents or society or some institution, there's some standard and you fail to live up to it and so you incur guilt on yourself. And what a secular age comes in and says and is largely promotes and honestly more than we want to admit we accept is that there's no real objective right and wrong. No real objective right and wrong. That if you believe in our secular age there is an objective right and wrong, then you are viewed as someone who's primitive in their thinking. You're primitive, you haven't evolved yet, you haven't been enlightened yet, because you, once you get to know other cultures, other time periods, other people, you begin to find that what may be true for you may not be true for them. And so in our context, what we're we're constantly encouraged to do is to choose whatever standard, whatever standard makes you happy. Choose whatever standard, and it's never said in the negative, but what we're saying is choose whatever standard that doesn't make you feel guilty. Because the assumption is if there's a standard out there that makes you feel guilty, something's wrong with that standard, not with you. Because once again, there's no real objective right and wrong when it comes to personal morality. And so... Before we look into how the Bible critiques that worldview, it is really important we understand, well, what's good about that worldview? What's right about that what, the worldview I just described? Here's the thing our culture has gotten right. Our culture has gotten right that guilt and shame, if left alone in a person, are incredibly powerful and destructive forces. Our culture has rightly assessed that life is miserable when you are driven and defined by guilt. 
We have countless examples of people doing awful things to other people and awful things to themselves because of some sense of guilt they had. So many people who've had years and years of immense unhappiness because of some sense of shame they had. And then on top of that, you have history showing us that leaders and authorities, especially religious leaders and authorities, have used guilt and shame to lord it over people for their own self-indulgent purposes. Guilt and shame are so powerful, they've been used as a weapon to demean and abuse and gain power over people. And so Christians should rightly recognize where we agree with the secular age about guilt. We wholeheartedly agree that human beings were not made to live their lives in a constant state of despair, self-loathing, guilt, and shame. We agree that rescue is needed from this. We agree that God cares about rescuing people from guilt. We agree. And we can even understand why somebody would choose a standard that doesn't make them feel guilty because feeling guilty is a miserable place to stay. It's a miserable place to stay. But we disagree on how God rescues us from it. See, God doesn't rescue us from our guilt and our shame by removing his perfect and good standard that indicts us. No, he rescues us by meeting the standard himself by dying in our place and by giving you an identity and giving me an identity that is guilt-free and shame-free because it's based in the indestructible life of Jesus. That's where we disagree. And what is fascinating about the secular age in which we live, that for all of our attempts to remove any objective standard, people are still plagued by guilt and shame. Still plagued by guilt and shame, even those people who are convinced and promote themselves as people who have no standard to meet, they're totally free to do whatever they want, they still find themselves feeling guilty and ashamed because they find themselves not being as good as they thought or as wise as they thought or as loving as they thought or as strong as they thought. They still find themselves with that sense of shame because they're not who they want or who they think they should be. I mean, the number of counselors and therapists in our society tell me we're still dealing with guilt and shame. Uh, Listen, nothing is wrong with counselors and therapists. They're phenomenal gifts. But all I'm saying is maybe back in the day, people with guilt and shame would go to churches to deal with that. Now we've just privatized it and we go to counseling to deal with that. We're still trying to deal with it because what you find with human beings is that we are made hardwired to live according to some standard. We're hardwired, even those people, once again, who say, but not me, I'm not primitive like you, I have no standard that I live to. That in itself is a standard. That's a standard. Your new standard is not having standards. Do you know how to break that? By having standards. Or do you see the logic of it? It builds on itself, it's a circular argument. Every human being, can't help but live according to some standard, some law they submit themselves to. And what is fascinating is even the laws you choose for yourself, you still fail to uphold. Even the things that you self-selected into, you can't maintain perfection. See, human beings cannot get rid of their guilt and shame, no matter how hard we may try, because we were made to know and love God, and we lost him long ago. That's why we can't get rid of it, because we're not dealing with the actual source of the problem. We were made to know and love God, and we chose self over him. And we keep choosing self over him. And while we may misuse and misplace guilt, guilt is what we rightly feel when we fail God. When you and I fail God, guilt and shame is what we rightly feel when we fail him, because like any relationship that you've ever been in, Like any relationship, when you don't meet someone's expectations or standards for how they receive love, you're not just breaking their rules, you're breaking their heart. Rejecting their expectations is a rejection of them. And so when we fail God, we're not just breaking rules, we're breaking his heart. The scariest moments in my life, in my marriage with Lauren, we've married almost nine years. The scariest moments for me are when I've hurt Lauren and I don't feel genuine guilt and remorse. Those are the scariest moments. Because in a relationship, in a marriage, 
because we're both broken, because we're both imperfect, finite creatures, there's going to be emotional pain that comes with knowing someone deeply. That's how it works. But it's terrifying when I see that what I said or what I did clearly hurt my wife, and all I feel is self-justification. And all I feel is, well, you kind of had that one coming. It's not really my fault. It's terrifying when I see wounds in my wife and I don't interpret them as my failure. When I interpret them as, well, that's just who I am and you gotta learn how to deal with that. That's terrifying because what I'm saying is I value me more than you in this relationship. I value my sense of self more than our marriage and that is a terrifying spot to be because when I fail my wife, I want to feel some sense of guilt and shame and remorse, so it drives me back to her. So it drives me back to her. I hope all of you can agree with me on this, is that it is not a healthy thing to hurt someone you love, know that you hurt them, and feel no guilt over it. That's a sign of dysfunction, not health. It's a sign of health that when you hurt someone you love, You should, it's good and right to feel guilty and shameful because you value them so much. And by God and his kindness, what he will do in you is he will produce guilt and shame when you fail him not to punish you and not to drive you away, but to act as spiritual smelling salts to call you back. If he didn't care about you, he'd let you run the other direction, but because he cares and he wants you back, he produces guilt and shame when we fail to wake us up. And Psalm 51 is King David showing us, how do you return to God when you fail him completely and totally and utterly? How do you go back to him when you failed him in significant ways? And King David's gonna show us that there's three simple, uh, simple steps in dealing with your guilt is you go to God directly, you ask for mercy, and you're confident in his steadfast love. Let's read together the, the title. See together the title of the psalm. Every now and then the psalms, the writer will give you a title. It's, it's a description of the occasion of the psalm. Here's the title of this one. It says, to the choir master, a psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone into Bathsheba. So the occasion for this psalm is the lowest, most disgraceful moment in David's entire life. David had been called a man after God's own heart. He was called that because he had such intense zeal and devotion and love for God in every area of his life. He had gone from shepherd boy to the king of Israel. And he had been called this man after God's own heart, but as happens so often, As he grew in success and in strength, his joy and his love and his zeal and devotion to God began to shrink. Until one day he sees, while lying on his couch, at the top of Jerusalem, he looks down and he sees a beautiful woman bathing. And in that moment he shows that this man who had been characterized as being after God's own heart is about to reveal just how distant he is from God. He sleeps with her, he gets her pregnant, He attempts to cover that up, and then because he can't do it, he arranges the murder of her husband. And what's incredible, that on its own is incredible, but to show you where David is at with God, it's not as if David sees what he's done and goes, I can't believe I did this, and he tells somebody. He doesn't tell anybody. He keeps it to himself. For, listen, a year, he keeps it to himself, not telling anybody, probably thinking, okay, I've gotten away with it. Until God sends Nathan to confront him. And that story of God sending Nathan to confront David, if you have time time to read it, you should later on. It's an incredible story and it shows you and me, out of his love and mercy for you, God will find you out in your sin to show you you haven't tricked him. I've seen in my life and in this church, God will go to great lengths to make sure his people know you're not fooling anybody by hiding your sin. You're fooling yourself and other people, but you're not fooling God. And David had been guilty for a year. 
For a year he had been guilty, but he was legally guilty, but psychologically he wasn't really aware of it yet until Nathan comes, shows him his sin, and he is crushed by his sin. David's overwhelmed. He's despairing. And so the first thing he does in his immense guilt and shame is he goes to God directly. Look at verses 1 through 4. He says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. He realizes his guilt. He realizes his sin and his shame. And the first thing he does, he speaks to God directly through prayer. This psalm is not a general description of how he's doing to people to hear about his sin. It's not his secret diary, writing down his thoughts and just processing out loud so he can have clarity of thought and mind. He's addressing the psalm to God. He keeps using the word you, 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 you. He's talking to God. The entire psalm is to you, God. And that, that may seem very obvious and very simple, but what I have found in my life and the life of the people of this church is we so often skip that vital step. Instead of talking to God directly, we tend to talk to other people. We tend to feel guilty and feel ashamed, and we tell our friends, we tell our roommates, we tell our spouse, we just talk to other people about it. We, probably, we may even apologize to other people for what we did to them. We talk to people, not to God. Or then we think about it a lot. We stress over it. We analyze it. We're anxious about it. But we don't talk to God. We may even talk about God to other people, but we skip the step of talking to him. Because we don't want to directly talk to the one we've wronged. That's the thing that you and I have to know and have to remember is that when you sin, your sin is ultimately and primarily against God. If you want to be reconciled to somebody, the first step is to talk to the person that you've wronged. Well, the person you've primarily wronged is God. So even though our sin, just like David's, hurts other people and hurts us, it's against God primarily. It's against God first and foremost. Because the reason... The reason there's a, such a thing as sin is because God has outlined really clearly, I've made you to love me, and here's how I receive love from you. And sin is any time we don't do that according to his word. This is what he says in verse 4. He says, against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Now think about that for a second. Against you and you only? Now, David, I, I get the heart, but you killed somebody. I think you sinned against him. You committed adultery. I'm pretty sure you sinned against your wife. What's he saying? He's not saying his sin has not been against other people at all. He is saying things like adultery and things like murder are wrong because they offend God. Because they offend God. He's making an incredible statement about truth and reality. He's saying... I determine and I know what's right and what's wrong, not based off my own intuition, but based off what offends and pleases God. What offends and pleases God. And like, once again, like any relationship, you don't get to tell somebody they're not offended. Like, you don't get to tell somebody you're not hurt. When I first got married, I do that all the time. She'd be really sad, I'm like, fine. Like, that's not how, that's not okay. Not okay. You may disagree whether or not they should be hurt, but you don't get to tell somebody that they're not hurt. You know that. You would hate it if someone came to you and you were genuinely offended by what they said or what they did or you're hurt and they tell you you're not. They're the only ones who determine that. But we do it to God all the time. God gets to say what offends him and what doesn't. God gets to determine what pleases me and what hurts me. We don't get to tell God he's not offended. And too often you and I buy the lie that if if I'm doing something that makes me happy and I don't see it hurting anyone around me, then God has no right to be offended. God is saying from his word, no, it may seem small to you, it really hurts me. 
It may feel to you like it's, I'm overreacting, but I'm telling you, this is what it does to me. And David is saying, though I have broken the hearts of many people, the first heart I broke was God's. The first one I offended was him. And so he models for us well, when you feel guilty and ashamed, ask yourself this question. I do it to myself all the time. You're feeling guilty, you're feeling ashamed, ask yourself this question, have I actually talked to God about it or have I just talked to other people? Have I actually consciously addressed prayer to God about my guilt and my shame or have I just thought about it a lot? Too often we confuse thinking for praying. They're different things. Prayer is a conscious mindfulness, Godwardness in my thinking and my thoughts and my prayers to him. And he says, when you're guilty, he's showing us when you're guilty, you go to God directly. That's the first thing. The second thing you do is you ask him for mercy. Look at verse one again. He says, at right out of the gates, have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. The first thing out of his mouth is, have mercy on me. The first thing he says is, forgive me. Listen, he does not caveat his apology or his request with all the circumstances that led him to this point. He doesn't say something like, I'm sorry, but. That's the worst way to apologize, by the way, if you're taking notes. Don't apologize by saying, I'm sorry, but I mean you're a little sensitive. I'm sorry, but you had that one coming. I'm sorry, but I had a hard day, but you don't know what my life is like. That's not an actual apology. What you're saying is, I'm sort of sorry, but not really. And David doesn't come to God and say, God, have mercy on me, but remember, she was the one bathing outside on a rooftop. That's all I'm saying. He doesn't say, have mercy on me, God, but remember, I've done a lot for you. He doesn't say, have mercy on me, God, but remember, I was really unhappy, God. You know how hard things have been. You know the weight of being a king. You know the stress of that. Me and my wife hadn't had a good relationship and God, I know, I know what I did was wrong, God. I get it. I'm I'm wrong. But remember, there are other things that fault more than just me. I love David for his response. He just owns it. He doesn't caveat. He doesn't excuse. He owns it because here's why he owns it. He knows that his sin is even bigger than these circumstances. He is recognizing, he is seeing clearly, oh, my sin is even bigger than murder and adultery. He realizes, oh, my sin has been with me my whole life, and this is just evidence of how deep it goes. Verse 5, he says this. He says, behold... I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. He's saying, from the moment I was born, from the moment of my conception as an embryo, I have known this desire, I have known this predisposition, I have known this inclination to distrust and displease and rebel against you, God. He's saying, adultery and murder came from here. It came from my own heart. Were there circumstances at play? Sure. Maybe my upbringing had to do with it. Maybe being king really is hard. Maybe my marriage was tough. Maybe, maybe, maybe. But all that came ultimately from me. It was my own sin that produced these actions. And that's why he keeps requesting, God, have mercy on me. All those statements, all those different phrases of wash me clean and blot out my transgressions and hide your face from my sins and create in me a clean heart and restore to me the joy of your salvation. All those are different ways of saying the very first line, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me because he knows there is nothing I can do to make up for what I've done. I need God's mercy He says this in verse 16 and 17. He says, for you will not delight in sacrifice or I would give it. And you will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. Oh God, you will not despise. He's saying, if there was some religious activity to do, I'd do it. 
I, I, God, I would do it if it meant burning incense or giving money or reading my Bible or going to church or being a little bit better in my life. I'd do it. But he's saying, God, that's not what you're after. That's not what you want. God, you don't want excuses or self-justification or promises how I'll be different and I'll never fail you again. You want brokenness. You want contrition. You want me to own it completely and ask for mercy. And so many of us need to hear that. Because far too often in our guilt, in our shame, we come to God as if what he really wants is either an alibi or payment. We come to God as if he wants an alibi or a payment. So we come to him as if he wants an alibi. He wants to know, explain to me why this happened. And what he's really looking for is for you to explain, well, this happened and this happened and this person said this and I said this and I promise that wasn't, that's not who I really am. I'm better than that, God. That's not who I really am. This is my alibi. And we excuse and we justify. And other times we think, no, God doesn't want an alibi. He wants payment. We think we, we functionally come to God in our guilt and our shame, and we think he is waiting for us. And first thing he says is, what happened? How are you going to fix that? How are you going to be more disciplined? Like, what's your plan to make sure that never happens again? What are you giving me as collateral to prove your sincerity? How are you going to beat yourself up today to make sure that I know you mean it? And this idea of paying God for mercy, this idea is what keeps many people from believing and following Jesus. They think that sounds, and rightly so, that sounds exhausting. It sounds exhausting to have every time you fail God, you have to come before him and grovel over his clenched fist saying, what are you going to pay me? What are you going to give to make sure I'll be kind to you again this time? And listen, over time, over time, if you try to pay God for mercy, you'll either eventually leave him or resent him. If you try to pay God for mercy, you'll either leave him or resent him. You'll leave him because you're so tired of hating yourself. You're so tired of it. You're so tired of having to make a promise that you know from experience you're going to break really quickly. It's debilitating to again come to God and think, I already promised him, I gotta promise him again, I'll never do it. You eventually run out of things to offer. You eventually are tired of self-loathing, so you leave. Or, or you stay around God and you stay religious, but you resent him. And you don't know that you resent him until there's something in life that you want and he doesn't give it and you are furious. Or you see someone else get something you want and you hate them for it. Why? Because you've been paying God off for years and now it's his turn to pay. You've been paying for mercy. You've been making promises. You've been going to church. You've been reading your Bible. You've been being good. And now here you go, God, and not give me the thing that I want. And you secretly resent him because eventually hating yourself, and eventually you don't have enough flesh to give to him as payment. Eventually it runs out. And David has written this psalm for you and for me to save us from the powerless, endless cycle of either denying our need for mercy or trying to pay for mercy. He just owns it. He says, mercy is what I need and I have nothing to give to you, God. There's no currency that I possess to sway you. I'm too sinful, I'm too heinous. All I can ask is for mercy and forgiveness and kindness and I know I don't deserve it. I know I haven't paid for it. I know I didn't earn it. How is David able to be this bold? Like how is someone who has committed adultery and murder, able to come before God and lay himself completely at God's disposal and say, God, have mercy, I trust you, I offer nothing. How is he able to be that bold and that confident? It's because he's confident in God's steadfast love. So that's the third step. He goes to God directly, 
He asks him for mercy, and he does it all according to God's own steadfast love. Look at verse 1 again. He says, have mercy on me, O God, according to what? According to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. He's saying, I need mercy in line with and in equal measure to, God, your infinite storehouses of love and mercy. See, David's not walking up to God thinking, man, mercy and grace are going to be really hard to find with him. That's so many of us. We come to God when we failed, and secretly we're thinking, okay, it's going to be really hard to get him to be merciful. But what David is saying is, no, I'm coming to you precisely because I know you have mercy. If God doesn't have mercy, and David knows that, he should run in the other direction. Because he's been found out, he's lied for a year. He used the power God gave to him to crush other people and take advantage of them. If God doesn't have mercy, he should run the other way. But he knows, God, it's who you are to be merciful. God, I didn't make you merciful. That's who you are. He's confident that coming to God for mercy is not forcing his hand. It's laying hold of his willingness. Because he knows God had revealed himself to Moses long ago, long before David. That while he's a God who's perfect and just and holy, he also is abounding in steadfast love. Look at Exodus 34, when God revealed himself to Moses long before David. He said this, the Lord passed before him, before Moses, and proclaimed, this is God speaking, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Let's stop right there. That phrase is used all throughout the Bible, throughout the Psalms, throughout the Old Testament, throughout the New Testament, as a succinct description of God's character. Merciful, gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Verse 7, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers and the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. God does not have to conjure up mercy and love and forgiveness. It's who he is. Now what does he say? He says, I take sin and offense towards me very serious. And he says, I will by no means just clear the guilty if they don't come to me for mercy. But he says, if you come to me, here's what you'll find. I'm merciful and I'm gracious and I'm really, really slow to get angry. And I'm long-suffering, and I'm faithful, and I'll have steadfast love to a thousand generations of people. David committed murder and adultery, and yet there is never any doubt in his mind if God is merciful. Don't confuse his, his utter despair and shame and hatred of his sin and what he's done as him wondering, will God forgive me? No, he knows what God's character is like. He knows, no, there's mercy with God, not because he's good and not because his sin isn't that bad, but because God is just that extravagant in his mercy. So hear me really clearly. When you go to God for mercy, you never have to wonder what the answer is. You never have to wonder what the answer is. You never have to wonder because you're not the one who made him merciful. You're not the one who turned him into a merciful God. That's who he's always been. That's who he's always been. It's what he promised to be. But how can you know? How can you really know his answer is always yes to our request for mercy? Well, David knew this because he had seen God's great power in Israel. He knew the stories of how God had saved Israel from Egypt. He knew the stories of the parted Red Sea. He had his own story from going from shepherd to king. He had seen God reveal his steadfast love again and again and again. What do we have? How do we know? We have something even more sure than a dry Red Sea, an incredible story of a shepherd boy becoming king. We have the death and resurrection of Jesus. When you are, more than maybe you want to admit, when you fail God and you are nervously wondering, will he receive me? Like you're genuinely thinking, I hate myself. 
I hate myself for what I did. I hate this insecurity. I hate this sin. I know the promise I made, and I just failed him again. I don't even want to be around him. I don't even want to pray because I just know the answer is going to be no. When you find yourself nervously wondering, will he receive me? Have I done too much? You have to remember, he gave his son before, his son for you long before you wanted him. He gave his son for you when you were at your worst. The famous verse of John 3.16 is, for God so loved the world, he sent his son. The world didn't request it. The world didn't say, God, be merciful to us. He said, I want to send you my son because I am merciful. I am kind. I do forgive sin. I do want to rescue you from shame. You're not the one who made him kind. That's who he is. And I am desperately trying to teach my kids this incredible hope that Jesus removes guilt. So my uh, two oldest, Elle and Henry, they are perfect pictures of what you and I are like when we fail God. So my kids, when when they are very aware that they have failed, that they've been mean to somebody, that they've been disrespectful, disobedient to mom or dad, or they have yelled at their friends, or yelled at the brother or sister, or hit them, or bit them, or something, like stole money from them somehow. Like when that, when that happens, it's fascinating to me too that kids, even young three-year-olds, like Henry, my son, they have this inherent conscience that knows I've wronged somebody and I feel bad about that. So when, when they have this moment, they feel bad, they're terrified, and, and when I'm parenting well, when I'm parenting well, which is not all the time, but when I am parenting well, what I'll do is I'll take Ella or Henry and I'll pull them aside. I'll pull them away from our family because I don't want to instruct them and maybe discipline them in front of our, anyone else. I want to be just me and them. And I'll put them in my lap, and usually they're scared, they're crying, and I'll try to comfort them, and I'll begin to teach them. I'll say, and even though, the first thing I try to do is, even though they hurt They hurt their brother or sister or mommy or daddy. I tell both Ellen and Henry, hey, the person you hurt most is God. The person whose heart is most broken is God's. And so before we ask anyone else for forgiveness, let's ask God for forgiveness. And almost without fail, they say no. Almost without fail. Every time they're like, no, don't want to do that, not at all. No, no. They're just like us. They're so scared to ask God for forgiveness. They just want to just get away from me. I I don't think that you're going to be kind. So I have to really encourage them and admonish them and sometimes basically tell them, we're not leaving this room until you ask for forgiveness. That's how it's going to work. Like, you will be forgiven or I'll die in this room. That's how it's going to (laughs) work. And what's fascinating is that eventually they'll say it, and normally it's a very sheepish, God, will you forgive me, please, amen. Like, that's what they say. And I love their prayers because they remind me that even the weakest cry of faith is powerful with God. Even a sheepish request that sort of wonders what he's going to say is heard by him. And when they ask God, God, will you forgive me for what I did? I love in that moment getting to tell them, I go, do you know what he said? I purposely get really excited. Do you know what he said? And I'll shake him and get him jumping around. Do you know what he said? He said, yes. He said yes. And one time El goes, how do you know he said yes? I was like, you didn't hear that? You're not forgiven. Like, you didn't hear that voice? No. I tell her, I know that he said yes because Jesus died for sin and I don't need a new word. I don't need a sign in the sky to tell me he said yes. I have an empty tomb in Jerusalem that tells me he always says yes. He always says yes. I don't have to wonder, and El neither do you, and Henry neither do you, and church neither do you. You don't need a new word. You have the best word ever given to humanity, an empty tomb, and a promise in 1 John 1, 7 that says, but if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, We deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. In verse 9, here's the promise. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins every single time and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So long as we have sin in this life, 
And the Bible just said, if you say you don't have sin, you've deceived yourself and the truth is not in you. So long as we have sin, we will have an experience of guilt and shame. But so long as we have Jesus, it will never have the last or defining word over you. It'll never have the final word. It's never how your story ends. It's never what drives and dictates your life. The answer from heaven is always yes, a thousand times yes. And sometimes you'll ask for forgiveness and you'll sit there in the silence and you'll wonder, you'll know what the text says, but your feelings won't match the text. It won't match what God did and that should never cause you to wonder. Because sometimes you'll ask for forgiveness and you'll still feel sad over what you did. You'll ask for forgiveness and you'll still feel some sense of guilt and remorse. You'll ask for forgiveness and your circumstances may not change. You'll ask for forgiveness and God may still discipline you and give you consequences for your sin. But you never have to wonder what his answer was. Because of Jesus, it's always yes. That's why when you're going to God and you're requesting mercy, you're always confident, not because of your goodness, but because of the work of Jesus. And you always end, not on your promises or your battle plan of how you're going to be different. You end always and focus always on the steadfast love of God in Christ. There's an incredible quote I want to read to you from Rob, uh, Robert Murray McShane. He was a pastor in the 1800s in Scotland. He actually died when he was 29 years old. He has this quote, one of the lines in it changed my life years ago. I'm going to read it to you. He says this, learn much of the Lord Jesus. For every look at yourself, take 10 looks at Christ. That'll change your life if you do that. For every look at yourself, take 10 looks at Christ. He's altogether lovely. Such infinite majesty, and yet such meekness and grace, and all for sinners, even the chief, live much in the smiles of God, bask in his beams, feel his all-seeing eye settled on you in love, and repose in his almighty arms. Even in a secular age that has removed any objective standard we can't get rid of guilt and shame. They can't be avoided. But the gospel of Jesus is the same in every age. It's the same in every age. Jesus always stands ready to forgive and pardon and cleanse and set free. And you need to know this experience and do this often. Not just one time years ago. Often for big and small sins, go to God and ask for mercy confident in his steadfast love in Jesus. Let me close with this. When you go through this and you're restored and God reminds you of his mercy and you're aware that though you don't deserve it, he has forgiven you in Christ, hear me really clearly. Christian, your brothers and sisters in Christ and your non-believing friends and family members and coworkers and neighbors, they need to hear these stories. They need to hear these stories of how God has shown you and keeps showing you mercy. Listen, every single person you know at some point in time is going to be struggling with guilt and shame. Don't buy the facade and the face people put on like they're strong and nothing's wrong with them. Every human being is wrestling with this at some level in some way most of the time. And what's sad is in a secular age, the one source of forgiveness we think is more and more improbable. And so don't just tell them Statements about God. Tell them your story, specifically how he's shown you mercy last week and how he's shown you mercy last year. I love what David says in, in verse 12. He says, restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit he says, restore me. I'm far from you because of my own sin. Restore me. Uphold me. Verse 13, then I will teach transgressors your ways. What ways of God? The ways of his mercy. He says, I want to teach them that at my lowest, most disgraceful moment, you were there to forgive me. I want to show them your ways. And he says, when I show them your ways of mercy, 
and sinners will return to you. Our culture may doubt our theological statements. They may disagree with our ethical standards. They may find our apologetic arguments for faith unpersuasive, but they can't deny the power of our story. They can't deny it. They can't deny the power of the story of murderers and adulterers and prostitutes and self-righteous hypocrites and power mongers and racists and addicts and drunks and cowards and cheaters and liars and lovers of money and people pleasers and idolaters like us being shown mercy and love by God like him. Mercy that's so strong and so potent that all those titles I just listed, none of them apply to us and define us anymore. Even when we live in ways that would say, that's what I'm like. His mercy says, that's not who you are. It's not who you are. You don't deserve it, but it was my joy to give mercy to you. Christian, your friends, people in this city, they need you to show them the way home where there's no more guilt and no more shame. And they don't just need you to say, hey, that's the way over there. I've never personally been, but that's where you should go. They need to hear, no, this is how you walk down the pathways of God's mercy. And there are moments down the path home where it feels gut-wrenching because you are owning up to things that have caused you guilt for years. And when you get to this point on the pathway home where there's a, a curve and you can't see around the bend and you can't see home quite yet and that moment is terrifying because you you're not sure if it's going to lead to the father that you've been told and you've been promised. But if you can get around that bend and you can own up to your sin, I'm telling you, you're going to see on the porch a father who's smiling at you. You're going to see the one you have wronged and offended in the most egregious ways, and he's not going to be arms crossed, frowning. He's going to be ready to receive you with joy. And he's going to have a promise for you that says, I slaughtered my son so you would always know I want to be merciful to you. I did all of that so you would know I'm always inviting you into the party of my love. Christian, this city and your family needs those stories. They need somebody who has walked down and tread that path many times before to show them the way. Let's pray together. Father, if you were to keep a record of sins, God, who could stand? God, if, if you every day just held over us all the ways we failed you and all the ways we wronged you, God, life would be miserable because we fail you all the time. We wrong you all the time. And God, there are so many of us in here who have convinced ourselves that living with a low-grade feeling of guilt all the time is just what life is like. God, would you set them free from that tonight? So many of us in this room, we have been driven by our guilt and shame in such powerful ways to be successful, to be liked. And God, they're not doing the trick. So many of us who don't know what it's like to truly be confident in your love. God, in this moment, would you remind us from your word, we never forced your hand. That your mercy is not contingent on us in any form, in any fashion. That Jesus, you already gave us a sure word. When you died on a cross and you rose from the dead, you guarantee the answer is always yes. Yes. A thousand times yes. God, in this secular age, Help us be a people who are confident that no guilt and no shame and no curse and no chains apply to us any longer. God, not because we've been good, but Jesus, because you've been kind. 
God, make us those kind of people. We pray these things and ask these things in Christ's name.